month when the United Nations hosted a conversation about climate change, artists, dancers, actors, and comedians engaged in the issue as well. They had their own little climate summit in addition. In New York comedy clubs, people engaged in what we might consider a form of gallows humor, which brought things to new heights or perhaps to new lows. For climate change, humor is now a thing. You can Google it on the internet. It, there is quite a whole genre of it. Here are some examples. Two planets meet. The first one says, how are you? Not so well, the second one says. I've got the homo sapiens. Don't worry, the other replies. I had the same, and it won't last long. <laughs> or a couple examples. I won't give you the whole thing, but a couple examples from a list of the top 10 best things about global warming. Number one, why pay for tattoos when melanoma's free? Number two, no more pesky weeds. In fact, no more pesky plants of any nature. Three, golfers, this is for you. They on, you only need a putter and a sand wedge. And finally, for those who cannot get enough of global warming, one word, Venus. So I think the reason for this gallows humor is obvious, because we need ways to find some kind of toehold, some kind of way to begin to think about these issues which seem so big and so difficult and so hard. More than half the United States population repeatedly surveyed about what they believe about climate change and global warming will say over and over again that they feel helpless, that they feel hopeless, and that they don't want to think about it because they don't know what to do. Too many people think that there is nothing to be done and so, as one website puts it, we think globally, act locally, but panic internally. Many of us are trying not to think about this topic. And survey after survey shows us that many of us who are thinking about it are not talking about it with one another. And that is important as well. Over the last year, I've really begin, begun to contemplate this issue in a very serious way and make it part of my ongoing meditative practices and to think about what it is that I can do, though I can't do the things I would wish and cause major systemic and planetary change. I think long and hard now about plane travel. The, inter the national group that I have um, chair, we have reduced the number of national meetings we're having so that we reduce our carbon footprint. I have made myself, as a result, literally cross-eyed on day-long video calls. And if you've ever spent more than a couple hours on a video call, let me tell you, it is not a fun way to go, but it's better for the planet. And I'm working very hard to reduce the use of, um, of, of petro petroleum-based products, including plastics, in my life, but more on that later. So last weekend, it is really significant that this congregation took a vote to affirm our commitment to stop being silent about climate change. And our new climate action team, which is, is carrying out this, this work of environmental activism that our Green Committee and so many of our folks have, um, have honored, and I want to honor in particular Tony Newey and Dee Simmons, who are here today, who helped us keep going on that work for so many decades here. Yes, we can definitely, that's a great idea. We know that environmental engagement, environmental activism is in the DNA of this congregation. What we also know if we look around this morning is that it's hard to engage on this particular set of issues. So I want to thank each of you for being part of this conversation and I want to invite us to invite others to be part of other conversations that we will be having on an ongoing basis. Today, after our services from one to two, we'll have our first salon, as I mentioned. It's going to be about climate change, but it's also gonna be about how we engage that as a spiritual issue. The Unitarian Universalist Association put out a book last year, Justice on Earth, as our common read, and we've had two gatherings around that book, and we'll be having one more. 
We will be speaking out loud about the unspeakable. We will be expanding our work to support and advocate for those measures that can slow the pace of climate change. And I think we're all aware now that many scientists believe that we cannot stop or reverse, but we can slow, and that slowing is very important. But here's the thing. The fact that the first Sunday after this very important vote is the Sunday closest to the Jewish High Holy Day of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, seems very real to me, very real. For by every measure, we have so much to atone for in the area of climate, and it begins by admitting that we feel anxious, worried, and powerless in the face of climate change. That's where we start, where we are. And as many observers point out, that we know this issue amplifies the negative impacts of so many other issues. So what are we to do but to begin again in love? Atonement is a word I appreciate revisiting this time every year. It can be read literally as at one mint. And when we begin again in love, we do so by recognizing in this particular year that our fear is caused by the ways that we recognize that we're all in together in this small blue boat of a planet. The beauty of the Jewish tradition is that we do have that cycle of admitting one's sins, being aware of them, vowing to do better, resting, waiting, going on. It comes up every year this holiday that we don't just do this once and then say that we're done. It comes up every year because the wisdom in our Jewish ancestors is that they knew that every year there would be ways that we had fallen short. And so every year we would need to renew our deepest commitments. Every year we would fall short. We would sin, if you will, in the archery sense of that word, which means simply to miss the mark. We would sin, and then we would need to have the courage to pick up the bow again. So here is the thing. If religion is about those things fundamental to affirming life, what is more essential to the affirmation of life than the discontinuity of life that we are seeing on our planet and taking action to be aware of it, to speak out about it, and to do what we can. And if religion is about holding together those things that are too great for us to hold alone as individuals, what could be larger to hold than the very fate of our planet upon which we are so dependent? And if religion is about finding the ties that bind, what, are, what could be more essential than tying ourselves to those actions that will ensure that those who come after us will have the best chance of thriving as well. This is very important religious work. As people of faith, we are also a people of science. And we understand that scientific truths and faith traditions are not mutually incompatible. And we need to join with those incredible growing lists of Christians who have been doing a lot to bring attention to these issues and to actually reclaim the truth of science in a world in which science itself is increasingly feeling endangered and the forms of scientific truth. Harvard climate research change researcher Naomi Oreski says, many people have the impression that there is significant scientific disagreement about global climate change. It's time to lay that misapprehension to rest. There is scientific consensus on the fact that the Earth's climate is heating up and human activities are part of the reason. We need to stop repeating nonsense about the uncertainty of global warming and start talking seriously about the right approach to address it. United Church of Christ minister, leader, and climate change activist par excellence Jim Antal notes that survey after survey show that the majority of people do believe that climate change is real, as I said. But about 60% of them say that they do not talk about it 
because they consider it socially unacceptable as a topic. And that they also fear being told that this is too political to discuss. When, as I just said, this is deeply religious work. They are very concerned because corporate interests have succeeded in labeling those who want to draw these attentions to our, to our consciousness as radical, extremist, and political. Antal asks us to consider what is actually radical, caring about the planet which we are dependent upon or allowing a very small group of very wealthy corporations and individuals to take resources for their own use at the cost of all forms of life on our planet. Why is that politically correct? Today, in the season of atonement, let us say today what we already know, that climate devastation is already here. It's why our fire seasons have become longer. It's why we are hosting our beloved guest from the drought-destroyed country of Honduras. And it's why climate-related migrations are sweeping the globe up on all sides. Climate change touches every issue that we face, but it is the one that we face that is more dramatic and which mirrors and amplifies all inequities in our society as well. In this paradoxical age, it is both true that while the actions we take will not stop the planet from warming or changing at this point, but scientists also believe that doing what we can, whether it's eating less meat or advocating for science-based policies, recognizing the dangers and our participation in a hyper-capitalism run amok lifestyle, reducing air travel or ending as quickly as possible our reliance upon petroleum-based products such as plastic will make a difference in the rate and pace of change. And that could make a difference in the life that our grandchildren, our children, and our great-grandchildren will enjoy for a degree or a delay in global warning, warming is a very big deal. So in the season of atonement, we can atone for our silence by beginning to talk among ourselves about what we know in our hearts, that our planet and all its creatures, including us, are in trouble, and that though we do not know if we can reverse what has been done, we must do what we can, and we must ask those who represent us to do what they can to keep faith with the future. This Yom Kippur says that we begin again with resolve. And one writer from within our own tradition says of this important ritual time of introspection and recommitment, when someone hurts us or we hurt others, the goal is not only that the person who is hurt forgives, we also need to forgive ourselves and then start over in love. We need to forgive ourselves for what we have not done to date, but we cannot allow what we have not done to keep us from doing what we can. Sometimes our efforts will be small and sometimes they will be maddening. And I wanna end with a very specific, I wanna include a very specific example of my own efforts this summer. I decided one month in August that I would try very hard to continue my efforts to reduce my use of new plastic. Some people here have lifestyles where they've almost completely done away with that in their life. I'm not there yet. I'm still working on it. So I'm here before you as, you know, one of these people that sinned and needs to be forgiven and begin again in love, right? So so I go into a shopping trip on a particular a particular Monday, which is generally when I grocery shop, and I go into the store armed, remembering the bags, not leaving them in the car, remembering them, bringing them in, right? And I spend time looking at what I'm buying. I put back certain products. I take, I select the cardboard egg carton, of course, instead of the styrofoam. I've always done that. I have the milk and glass. I have the, the loose fruit rather than that encased in plastic. It can rattle around in my bag. That's okay. I even delight because I find yogurt that's in a cardboard container. And I'm very excited about that. I get home. I'm feeling really pleased with myself. I start unpacking my bags and I realize I've also bought five other things that have plastic in them that I just totally didn't even notice because I'm so used to buying them, including tofu. So there you go. 
my oh-so-holy yogurt does not absolve me of my sins, so I begin again the next week in love. We come together in religious community, not because we will embody our values perfectly, but rather to practice what we do together and to get better skilled at it, to support and encourage each other, and to continue to work together on that which we cannot do alone. We have much to learn and many ways to grow in our consciousness and how we live into our values. The American Association for the Advancement of Science has said that we need to think about what we know and we need to say it to everybody. We will be talking about that today, that particular article from one to two today. But they say basically there's a couple things we just need to keep saying over and over again. One, that climate change is happening. Two, that it is caused by human, affected by human activity. Three, that it is getting worse. And fourth, that we are actually at the global and policy level doing very little to actually address and slow down those parts which we can by reducing carbon emissions and other critical use of fossil fuels, for example. On this particular Yom Kippur, this time of atonement, we are invited to think about our climate and the legacy that we will leave to those who come after us. We need to think about the faces of all those youth activists that we held up just a few weeks ago, knowing that we actually need to continue that commitment to them every week. Jim Antal asks that we consider a new golden rule. And the golden rule, my friends, comes from our Jewish tradition. He says that we consider doing unto the next generation and the next generation and the next generation what you would have had done unto you. He says we are the first generation to foresee and the last generation to forestall the most devastating effects of climate change. It's time, he says, for us to ask a couple questions. Who are we right now? Who do we consider as our neighbor? And what are we committed to being right now? Perhaps our first step in this particular journey of atonement is to say that we are willing to admit that we are in fact concerned about climate change. What if this week you just say that to one person just one person this week, how would that be? We are hosting a regional climate change summit here in about two weeks, and we have many, many, many ways that you can get involved and help and make sure that we continue this conversation in our association and also in the interfaith community. As we enter into this new awareness, it's gonna be step by step, piece by piece, which will be frustrating for some who have been working on this for many, many years, but we need all of us to come into this space. Let us do so with the spirit of humility, with that awareness that we need the peace of wild things that the choir reminded us of. Let us remember that we have been, we have been affected by a basic set of values that are not our own, that are caused by those whose interests are not ours. Let us affirm that we do not own the earth, we are of the earth. We do not own one another. We do not have the right of domination over anyone or any species. We need to remember that we do not own the land. We belong to the land, the way that our indigenous relatives also reminded us of this. We need to remember most of all, most of us in this room, that we do not have the right to take for ourselves all the things that we think we need and want so that those who come after us will have none of the things they need and want. I want to close with the words of the great teacher and rabbi Hillel, who said, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? But when I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? <laughs>